Hi, um, thank you for joining us here. And I'm here with the lovely Rose Hendrickson. <laughs> and we were gonna talk about the upcoming Artist of the Week show at the Palmer Museum in downtown Palmer. So thanks for being here, Rose. <laughs> My pleasure, thank you for having me. Um, all right, so I, just to uh, get started here, I was wondering if you could tell us about the work that will be on display at the museum this week. Thank you. I have seven pieces on display down at the museum. Every one of the pieces is uh, student work that's been done in my BFA program of study um, over this past 18 months, I would say, worth of work. And um, most of what is on display has been accomplished in this last year. And it's all three-dimensional work. I have been majoring in sculpture. I've been an artist for over 40 years and worked in a lot of two-dimensional mediums. And in, when I decided to start school back in 2016, I decided what I really, really wanted to pursue was three-dimensional work. So I've been working in sculpture. So five of the pieces are ceramic and one of them is uh, steel and one is a mixed media with wood and aluminum and some other things. Wow. Uh, so, as a formerly 2D artist, how has the 2D part come into the 3D designs that you're, you're making? Well, they're definitely related in many important ways, and they have some of the same elements. You know, you have your element of color, balance, composition. All of those things are just as important in three dimensions as they are in two. I think what, I think what happens... Um, when you move into three dimensions, of course, everything is sort of, uh, and pardon me for using the word, exponentially changed. So now you have to worry about composition, balance, weight, and design from every direction. Every direction, from above, from below, and from all sides. So it just sort of, I mean, in a way, it's easier because when you're working in two dimensions, most of what you're trying to do is give the uh, illusion of, make the illusion of three dimensions come through in two. Um, not always, but m much of the time you're trying to do that, uh, suspend belief. But with a three dimensional project, it's, it's there. You feel your way through it. You, you move all around it. You look at what you're doing and, and you have to plan in space. You have to plan spatially when you're, when you're planning your, idea. Yeah, that, as I do 2D and 3D work as well, so <laughs> I can appreciate the challenge there. <laughs> um, it's so, wonderful. Yeah, how, so how do you choose your subjects? I know for, for school you're probably using prompts from the edu your educators, but... You got it. <laughs> That's what we do in school. And, but, but I will say, and I really appreciate the quality of instruction um, this is UAA. I'm attending UAA, and um, for the last, I started, uh, hang, hang on a second here. Sorry, I'm just trying to do something about background noise. Um, so, uh, the prompts that the professors give are very broad. They are specific only in like a suggestion. So um, the, the mixed media piece that I have on display down there is, uh, it's, my, it's the largest piece on display. It's made out of aluminum, wood, paint, vinyl. And the prompt for that piece was produce, a, a, produce an object using text. That's it. That's the prompt. There's no more. There's no text in a graphic way, text in a, in a uh, funky way, text in, in an abstract way, text in a realistic way. There's nothing like just create a piece using text as an element of design. So um, the, the prompts are usually quite vague. No, I mean, not like but you know what I mean, you've been through this, I'm sure, if, you, if you've done this sort of thing, they, they intentionally leave them open to your creative interpretation of the prompt. Yeah, yeah um, but that sounds, sounds very challenging. <laughs> it's very challenging. 
generating. It's also energy. incredibly stimulating and inspiring. Oh, hmm, let's see. And I mean, I don't know about you, but as an artist myself, my problem is not usually what to do, it's which to do. Mm -hmm. So generally when we get a prompt, not always, but often, as soon as they give us the prompt, I'm flooded with, oh, this, this, that, or this, or I could do this, or hey, I wonder what this would look like, you know, so um, I usually don't have too much trouble coming up with ideas, but sometimes they change. That same piece that I'm talking about here, when she gave us that prompt, I had, I don't want to say lame, but a very basic idea centering around the word Alaska, mm -hmm. which is my home, but not using the word Alaska, using other things. Actually, this, this sweatshirt I have on, let me tip this down here. This is, I wasn't copying this design, but uh, of course I'm in a mirror. This particular design appealed to me the first time I saw it. I loved the way they used text in the art, but also used our, our home state. I was born here, so it's, it's meaningful to me. I like it a lot. So I wanted to figure out something, you know, not the same, but that, that gave you that same inspiration. I was more toward, thinking about toward the north, you know, north and, and whole, that sort of idea. Anyway, um, this was our last prompt of the, of the semester. And as you can imagine, it coincided with the lockdown. So by the time we received this, you know, uh, started working on this prompt, we had been locked, we had been uh, on spring break and then we were on lockdown. So I'm like, okay, all I've been thinking about for the last week uh, and a half is this pandemic and the word exponential uh, going over and over again in my brain and how it took over my mind it took over my life, it was bigger than me. So if I'd had access to my classroom and, and to the materials that I have and, and the equipment that I have there, I would have made that piece very, very large. I would have made it maybe eight, 10 feet. As it is, it's about six. So I wanted to, I wanted to express how overwhelming and all consuming that that happenstance became pandemic, school, everything different. And then every day, another thing different, another thing different. And our world is different now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was, I was curious. Change. <laughs> yeah, I was curious from your previous work doing portraits and figurative work, if this experience has expanded the ways that you're thinking about those like happy moments in our life <laughs> and if you might be making work about that in the future i have a i have a tentative drawing um down thinking of more like it's a figurative piece that's uh, more in you know it's involved with this but thinking more about people i'm i'm still very much in love with figurative work i like it a lot i have a figurative piece in this little show it's a small piece of it's actually a self-portrait it's my own hands that are sculpted in the piece but the prompts for our our um, assignments um often inspire my imagination in different directions that are not figurative so most of the pieces that are down there are not and um but that doesn't mean that i'm not going to do more figurative work it's mm -hmm. definitely my first love um I like so many things that I don't nail myself down, but, but uh, figuratives are seductive. It's, it's, it's incredibly satisfying to do figurative work. There's something, I don't know, something sensual about, about working with the human form. It, it's, it's just really seductive. Yeah. Well, speaking of seductive, um, I know some of the materials you've used in the past, like pastels and even our silt from the Matanuska River, just have a very textural quality. And I was wondering how you have brought that into the work that's at the show right now. Well, textural and sensual, absolutely. When you're working in three dimensions, you're working in a sensual realm. So uh, <laughs> I discovered... <laughs> Well, not for the first time ever, you know, we all play with clay when we're kids, but within the last 18 months, I, um, I changed my secondary from painting to ceramics after taking a hand building class. And the first hand building class that I've ever taken in this really formal, I haven't taken a formal hand building class. It's totally different than your little package of clay and with a kid at home. It's completely different. And um, 
when you're working with clay, yeah, talk about seductive. It, you have your hands in the mud. There is nothing more primal than grabbing a material and forming it to your will. That's certainly not every element of hand building. There are so many other processes besides just touching it with your hands and moving it. But that is pretty primal. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I was also thinking about the transformation that happens with ceramic work in particular and how that's it must be very different than your previous life in two, two dimensions too, <laughs> that um, things kind of change a little bit in the kiln sometimes. Uh, or you get some happy accidents. Have you found that at all? I've been fortunate. I've been fortunate in that pretty much the things that I put in the kiln came out the way I expected them to when they came out with maybe just a couple of very rare exceptions. So I'm not experienced enough at working in ceramics. I've only been working with them here in this formal setting for about a year. So the stories I've told, I've heard and the things that I've seen other people go through though, yes, there can be some big changes. I will say, um, simultaneously this semester I did a wheel throwing class and the it's a different kind of clay different kind of firing different kind of glazes and what I'd gotten used to in hand building with the responses between the glazes and the under glazes what you see is what you get what you put on there is how it comes out but in the wheel throwing where they fire at a different temperature the glazes don't act the same way so when I was expecting a white surface on the background of something it didn't come out white it came out gray for instance so I did have some experiences like that. But on the whole, as far as transformation of a piece between two dimensions and three dimensions, I think that there's just as much transformation in each one. Um, you go from a blank sheet of paper or a blank canvas to having some sort of a representation of, of whatever, whatever it is you're trying to say. And that process is, is quite transformative. When, the, the metal piece that I had down there, I had a sheet of rusty metal. The processes that I went through to cut those shapes uh, according to a pattern, to bend and fold those shapes using heat, and then to weld those shapes together into the piece that's down there is very transformative. Mm -hmm. There's no comparison between the materials and the finished product at all. And yeah, clay, you got a lump of mud in a barrel. <laughs> and then you form it into something. <laughs> Fire, it turns into rock, changes from mud to rock, and then you cover it with glass. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Well, um, it sounds like you've just been trying all these new media, but I, I was also wondering over your many years of being a working artist, <laughs> uh, how have you been uh, keeping art interesting year after year? What kinds of things? Oh, I've been keeping art interesting. Wow, that's an easy job. <laughs> yeah. Art is interesting. Um, I guess because I, I'm curious and I like to try things. And um, I am driven to improve. I, I want, I have, I, ha I have goals, oh, what am I trying to say? Visions, visions, I have visions and I wanna to try to match the visions that I have. And um, those come so fast and furious, like very quickly, they come so quickly and they're so full and there's so many of them, I've probably forgotten at least as much as I'm ever going to accomplish. But I think the, the way I keep art interesting is just chasing my visions, you know, whatever the, and the visions change with my life. They change with my moods. They change with my experiences. They change with, with my associations, with my locations. Hmm. Yeah, um, and I know you're, you've uh, played the viola since you were very young, right? <laughs> I was curious if uh, music is still a strong part of I, obviously, it's a strong part of who you are, <laughs> but I was curious how it might be related to the work you're presenting now or work you want to make. Oh, that's an interesting question. And music is still very much a part of my life, although I regret to say that over the last <clears throat> two school seasons, I have reduced my participation in the local music productions because I simply haven't had time. My, my school schedule will have me working like 50, 60 hours a week and in Anchorage. And so it conflicts with the rehearsal schedules for the, 
formal musical associations I have. Um, but I certainly still listen to music all the time while I'm while I'm working and I have my instruments and I will not be in school forever and my my orchestral and community associations and music are strong. I have lots of friends in the musical community and um, music is very important to me. I don't ever see it leaving my life. As far as the art, <clears throat> I don't make any separation between music and, and um, visual art. I, art is art. Uh, music is emotion. Visual art is emotion translated. It's, uh, music is a conversation. Music is um, a painter. It paints pictures in your head. It, it, um, it informs and extracts your emotions. And visual art does the exact same thing. Sounds beautiful. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, I, I guess my last question, uh, or well, two more. Um, <laughs> first one was, what is next for you this summer? Shall we, will we be seeing any of your work at the State Fair again this year, if all that goes well? Or <laughs> well, the State Fair has been canceled, my dear. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You know. It's okay. And well, it's interesting because it, it does affect the answer to your question. The, um, another thing that I've done for 23 years, an art related business that I've had for 23 years is I am a henna artist. So I do the henna temporary tattoos. And uh, I, I was the first vendor who brought that to the state fair. And I will not, I mean, I'm, I'm just, all, all of the fairs that I do through the summer, except for one now, um, uh, have canceled or are waiting to give a final decision on canceling. Mm -hmm. So that is my income. That is my annual income besides artwork. Um, please, people, go to the museum and buy my art. <laughs> I need income this summer. But I'm, uh, I'm going to have to scramble for new ways to come up with, with the income that I need. I'm, I'm trying to apply for different relief programs. So far, I haven't really gotten through to anything. Um, it's a little frustration on, on that side of things. But the other thing is that, you know, I've, since I won't be having fairs, I'll have more time to create work. Summertime is usually a, a time when all I'm doing is, is henna and fairs and gardening. I'm also a gardener. Mm -hmm. So I, I've already got work lined up that I'm in my head that I want to try to get done for the summer. Excellent. I also have to be getting ready for it. My final year as a, a BFA student is, they're all very demanding, but it demands that I gather my thoughts in such a way that I can concentrate on producing a specific body of work over the winter with the goal of having a show on that specific body of work. So I have to, I have to figure a lot of things out over the summer in relationship to that specific body of work. What am I going to do? Why am I going to do it? What are my goals? How am I going to approach it? You know, how am I going to disperse the time to create these pieces across the two semesters that I'll have in which to create them. Um, what am I going to say about them? Uh, the writing about my art is a huge challenge for me. I'm still really stumbling along trying to communicate myself <laughs> about myself and writing with it. Artist statement, what's that? Uh, I made it. Do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I Thank you for sharing all this. Uh, I'm really excited to see your work. Um, so last question is, how can folks get in touch with you if they would like to learn more about your work that you have for sale, especially, <laughs> or work that you're <laughs> making in the, in the next year? <laughs> um, people can certainly get in touch with me. I have, um, I have a Facebook page. It's Rose Hendrickson Fine Art, and my art is viewable for the most part on that page at any given time and you can contact me through that page also the show at the museum um all the pieces in there are for sale there are prices on them um and sam uh you can contact sam at the museum and he can work with you if you're interested in purchasing any items of the, in the show excellent all right Okay, well, thank you so much, and <laughs> we'll look forward to learning more and seeing more from your work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for taking the, time, taking the time with me today, Emily. I appreciate it. Thanks.